Mesdames et messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, veuillez accueillir, please welcome Etienne Hermit, Daniel Hoffer, Salim Nassour, Celeta Reynolds, en conversation avec In Conversation with Constance Chalcha. I think you're all very lucky that C2 did not ask us to do this dance, otherwise it would have been a whole different uh, story. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, just uh, to let you know that we will take questions through Slidos, so please fill Slidos with your questions, and we'll take the questions uh, within the last 10 minutes. But uh, as we speak, make sure you input your questions already. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll start with Celita. Uh, Celita, LA's congestion level are among probably the worst in the world. Today, are you using already AI to improve mobility and solve pollution, and in what concrete way? Yeah, I, um, I don't know what you mean. There's no traffic in Los <laughs> Angeles. It's totally fine, easy to get around town. Um, no, it, uh, Los Angeles is a huge region. It's a huge space. And back in the 1984 Olympic Games, um, the people who were running the Department of Transportation then, uh, in their wisdom, decided that the, what the city needed was an interconnected, um, intelligent way to manage traffic. And it was uh, in 1984. And the name of the, the system is called the um, uh, Automated Traffic Surveillance and Control System, uh, which is sort of a, a tricky name to be associated with the year 1984. Um, but we built uh, an interconnected system of 5,000 traffic signals to move uh, people and goods around the region. And one of the biggest challenges with that was that if you are building something in 1984, you are using 1984 technology, which means it is not hackable um, because everything is connected with fiber. There's no cloud. There's, no, um, there's none of that. So for us, the challenge is how do you take a system that moves more cars and goods and people um, than any other city in the world in terms of um, how much efficiency we get from operating an, an intersection and bring that technology into uh, the 21st century and looking ahead to the 28 games that Los Angeles will host um, Paralympic and Olympic Games in 2028. So we ha are, are very familiar with using um, sort of algor algorithms to manage things at scale because there's really no other way to do that in a city with 7,500 miles of streets and alleys. Uh, but it's a huge challenge for us to figure out how do we now embed machine learning into that system without, while retaining uh, its focus and really um, achievements around protecting privacy and around uh, cybersecurity. So for us, you know, LA has huge challenges. We know that technology is the way we are going to overcome them. Um, but we have to make sure that we're thoughtful about the legacy systems that we have that have um, been really successful for us. And maybe one question, because we're here to talk about trust. Today, do you already believe that the benefits of what you're building overweight some issues and in particular the trust issue? Yeah, so for us, you know, just about a year ago, Los Angeles launched uh, a set of APIs uh, in open source called the Mobility Data Specifications. We're now calling them the Mo Mobility Data Services. And those APIs are really the way that we think we are going to manage um, and plan for and regulate the city that we have. Um, but the the questions around algorithmic governance, the questions around who is the architect of the APIs, the question around um, how do you rebalance control between the public and the private sector so that you get the best out of the innovation that the private sector brings um, and you get the best out of uh, what the public sector brings, which is really um, being able to play a long game to achieve big audacious goals around climate and safety and uh, equity. Um, and so the trust issues are very complex 
And because the technology exceeds most people's sort of basic understanding, um, what we need is a new dictionary, a new glossary, a new way of talking about technology that demystifies it, that people can really understand, and that can, um, that can invite them into the conversation so that we can get all of those issues of trust out on the table. Because they're very, they're very real and they're significant. And we're confident in the track record that we've had using technology um, and balancing sort of all of these different issues, um, but we're about to enter a world where people have a lot of fears um, about the misuse of, of machine learning or algorithmic governance um, and the biases that, that could rest inside of it. Thank you. Uh, maybe, Etienne, uh, what you do on a daily basis is deal with trust issue. Uh, I don't know, all of us today saw your vehicle. Uh, I actually jumped in front of it at 8 a.m. to make sure it would stop. Um, you have a lot of pilots ongoing today, and what are the key learnings uh, that you get from all of those pilots? Yeah, so I think that uh, what we are doing, uh, and we use some uh, AI uh, in uh, our uh, system, um, what we are doing raises uh, two, two different kind of uh, uh, questions. One is about the safety, and of course it is a, a very important uh, topic. Is uh, is our system safe and does it bring the same level of safety or a better level of safety than a human uh, driver? And the second uh, issue is different, second question is different, is about the trust. Um, the trust that the consumer or the people can have in, a, in our system. And of course there is a correlation between safety and trust, but not uh, all the time. And what we see with uh, with autonomous driving is that even though the safety is higher, uh, the trust so far is, uh, is, is lower. Uh, I don't know exactly why. I think there is uh, something about, uh, uh, about uh, philosophy that people, they, 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 they don't like to, uh, to put their trust in a machine and they prefer to put their trust uh, in, uh, in people, even though the people are, are less, uh, less rel reliable in some uh, conditions than, uh, than machines. So what we see in, uh, in, the, in the different experiences that we have uh, all over the world, uh, because we operate uh, uh, shuttles all over the world, is that uh, from a consumer, uh, or from the people, whether they are inside or outside of the shuttle, uh, the initial reaction is quite, uh, uh, is, is, is uh, some skepticism, but after a few minutes, uh, seeing the shuttle uh, driving, uh, the reassurance is, uh, is there. Uh, and we are very confident in the future that more and more when uh, our shuttle uh, are going to, uh, to be spread all over the world, the, the confidence and the trust uh, are going to, to come. Uh, and, and, and do you see differences between countries uh, in this trust issue today? And not so much from the, from the, from the citizen side, uh, but from the government side, clearly there is a, a difference of approach in the, in the way the regulation is going to come. Because of course, uh, the key in the future is going to be the regulation. Uh, currently, there is no regulation anywhere in the world which enables uh, a car to be, or a vehicle to be driven without a driver or a safety driver. Uh, I'm not sure that any uh, of the government wants to be the first to uh, issue the, the regulation. Uh, I think that everybody wants to be the second, but nobody wants to be the first one. Um, and in the approach, we, we, we see uh, basically two kinds of approach from, uh, from governments. The, uh, the first approach is based on uh, uh, companies' responsibility and accountability. So it's more uh, self-certification. Uh, and the second approach is more uh, about uh, 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 defining by the law what, how it's going to work and how it has to work. Um, and those two approach, the first approach is more uh, on the US, on the, I would say, Anglo-Saxon world, and the second approach is more of a uh, European, Latin uh, approach. So maybe, Dan, I assume you screen dozens of companies like Navia today with your fund. Um, what would you say are the limiting factors today for further deployment of AI 
in autonomous vehicle, but also in public transportation? Yeah, I, I can answer that. Can I, can I speak to the trust question for a moment yes. first? So I, I think trust is a really interesting question. Uh, I, I'm a venture capitalist. I'm, uh, my name is Daniel with, with Autotech Ventures. And, and if you look over the last few decades at the uh, evolution of trust, in the 1990s, people were afraid to buy things online uh, because they'd have to give their credit card and people were afraid that, that hackers would, would steal the, uh, the credit card. Um, and, then, and then you look at uh, online dating. Also, people were afraid to do online dating because uh, you know, they might be a serial killer. Uh, and then people were also afraid to stay in people's homes. Uh, and and you know, that has, people have gotten comfortable with that as well, uh, with sites like Couchsurfing and Airbnb and so on. So uh, I, think, I think trust evolves over time as people get used to it. And, and I think we're going to see that with, uh, with autonomous as well. Um, with regard to, to your, your follow-up question, one of the, the dynamics here is I, I think there are uh, different things that need to happen in order to enable uh, actual autonomous driving. Uh, first of all, there is the matter of reading uh, a situation, reading a scenario. So the, the inputting of data through sensors. Uh, then there's a the matter of interpreting the data. And finally, there's a the matter of acting on the data. Uh, and so all three of those things need to happen in, or, in order for, for autonomous driving to be possible. Uh, and there are obstacles in all three. So when it comes to inputting the data, there are issues with sensors. Does, how well does LiDAR work with uh, rain and snow and adverse weather conditions? Are the sensors covered in mud? Uh, things like that. All these things need to be solved. Uh, then when it comes to interpreting the data, obviously that's uh, typically more of a, a software approach. And, and so it's very difficult to, to interpret data. There's, there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, and then acting on the data, that's where regulatory comes in. So of course, you need the mechanical uh, pieces in place, but, but you also need the regulatory approval uh, from the various sources. So there are a number of obstacles, but, but of course, at the same time, we're all seeing each of these uh, components getting, getting tackled in various ways by, by multiple players. Um, when you screen companies, I assume you look at financials, of course. Um, what other type of uh, criteria do you look at? Yeah, well, well so within that framework, uh, we look at which, which piece of the stack are, are they tackling. Uh, sometimes companies are trying to do everything, but that's, in, in many cases, more than they can choose. So, uh, so we're, we're supportive of piecemeal approaches in order to get a best of breed layer within, uh, within an ultimately integrated stack. And so then we're, we're always trying to assess, are they best of breed in this particular area? Uh, and, and some sectors, we think, lend themselves better uh, to, to some of these technologies than others. And, and I can talk more about that later, but, but uh, uh, off-highway autonomy is, is, is especially interesting uh, to us for that reason. Thank you. Salim, um, so intelligent transportation at scale will r rely very heavily on cloud. Um, I was reading, uh, I think, the most recent driving technology processes capture so many data, not only from camera, from light detection, from LiDAR, from radar, that combined all together, just the vehicle itself needs something around 4 to 10 terabytes, which is huge. But on top of this, I guess you need to add all the ecosystem data, so the data that uh, Celita uh, system is producing. Um, today, what does it mean from a technological point of view? Do we really need that amount of data? Yeah, yeah that's an interesting question, actually. So if I may, I will just change the question. It's, for me, the question is not, do we really need that data? The data is here, OK? So the real question for me is more, how can we use this data to have a better and safer uh, decision process making? You know, that's, uh, that will be uh, the way to rephrase the question. Uh, and this is a kind of question and answer we need to ask all together. Uh, as you know, from the very beginning, Google uh, is the kind of information company. So uh, we, uh, we are here to, uh, to organize the world's information and make it uh, universally accessible and useful. And on top of that, we try to help companies and, uh, and governments to, uh, to better use data and digital for the best. Okay. So for instance, uh, in mobility, one can use uh, navigation, can use uh, on maps, can use Waze, can use uh, uh, Android Auto, can use many, many products. But this is uh, 
not all the data that uh, everybody is producing, there is a lot of type of data. There is a, if you think about all the information that you can have on the road, for instance, you've got uh, information about uh, traffic, management traffic management system, you've got uh, traveler information system, you've got uh, vehicle control system, you've got many, many different type of systems uh, that brings information. And at Google, and at Google Cloud more spe specifically, we really think that uh, we should put all these data all together in the cloud. And the reason being because uh, it's it's going to be easier f for companies and government to, to re really take the best of this, uh, this, this data. So um, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you think about that, you need to collect all the information and then send that to the cloud. And it's going to be easier and easier with the, the coming of the 5G networks. So, uh, and then when you've got all this data in the cloud, the, the, ways to, uh, the better way to do that is to analyze this data and send it back to the traveler. Uh, in the most accurate way and quickest way. So that's the reason why we really focus on computing power as well, to make sure that we have the, the, best, uh, the best solution ever to propose uh, to, to different companies and governments. So this is what we, what we call a serverless. I don't know if you know, have you heard about serverless? So serverless is really a way, uh, serverless computing is a way to simplify all the process uh, for companies to really focus on what really matters, meaning using the data and not doing all the mundane around all, all, of, all of these things. If you take a concrete example, uh, you probably know the company uh, called BlaBlaCar, you know, the world leading uh, uh, long distance uh, carpooling service. Uh, so they're now taking the full advantage of, uh, of uh, the cloud. You know, they have put all their data in the cloud and on top of the flexibility and, uh, and the, the infrastructure that we put in place for them, they now can be really focused on getting the best of the data uh, they've got to propose a better customer experience. So that's the, real, the, the, the kind of thing that they, they can do with data today. And uh, uh, ultimately, I think that uh, the Google vision is really to, uh, and the Google intention is really to, uh, in the mobility space, to solve complex uh, challenges through technology. And we will, we will do that with partnership, both with companies and, 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 uh, and uh, administration and governments. Uh, and do you work with any of your panelists uh, on uh, a, as a partnership to be able to design the best possible system in the cloud? Well, no, we're working a lot with uh, the US administration at every different type of level. Is it a local, is it federal? And uh, uh, so we are having more and more uh, traction in the public sector uh, to work with, but not with the others companies so far. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that uh, on this currently, uh, uh, our uh, autonomous driving software has to work uh, locally in the vehicle because the connection is not, uh, uh, 5G is not there, and we have to rely on a very fast uh, uh, perception, uh, analysis, and decision, and execution uh, process, which is not uh, uh, possible right now uh, uh, online, but in the future, 5G uh, will uh, enable uh, a lot of uh, possibility. So th that's super interesting, I think, because we all talk and hear about 5G as being a key enabler for autonomous vehicle. What would you say, any of you, would be the other key enablers to accelerate on the front? Well, I, I guess from my perspective, you know, when you're talking about complex urban environment like Koreatown in Los Angeles or uh, downtown LA, um, I think the expectation that autonomous driving can happen in an unfettered way uh, is a, a long way off unless we figure out how to integrate uh, the infrastructure that we hold um, with the uh, with the AV stacks that are out on the road, because if we what we end up with is 20 different AV stacks all solving for each other, um, that we'll just get more of the same. We'll have more of what we have today, which is a very uh, you know public sector in its lane, private sector in its lane, um, and not really um, trying to break apart some of those uh, barriers. Because for, um, for many years, uh, vehicle manufacturers have done an excellent job at improving the experience and safety for you if you are inside the vehicle. 
But if you are outside the vehicle and you are walking around in a city like L.A., um, you know, we'd, we'd be wise to learn lessons from the last big disruption in technology when cars showed up in cities, um, street cars went away, and we invented this term jaywalking to criminalize crossing the street. So as we think about, you know, how can these technologies serve the city and not the other way around? How can they solve real problems? Um, then we're going to have to grapple with uh, these issues around how vehicles integrate with infrastructure, how they detect and respond to vulnerable users in the road, and how other people respond to them. Because I agree with you that trust evolves, but I would also say that trust is fragile. So, you know, if you look at the way that commercial aviation and the jet age kind of came into being, that's a situation where people do get on a, a large vehicle that flies in the sky and they have nothing to do with its operation. Um, and the, the FAA and the manufacturers and the technologists did a really good job of making safety a shared responsibility. But in watching what's happening with Boeing and the sort of, um, you know, how fragile that ecosystem is and how complex it's become because of the layering on of technology and software into the planes, um, I think it's a, it's a really good space for us to watch and learn from um, how once we get that trust, it's very fragile and it's a shared responsibility for us to make sure that we keep it so that we can actually use it to solve problems. Trust it's is intrinsically fragile, and yet at the same time, planes do crash sometimes, mm -hmm. but we still keep getting on them. That's right. So. But, but it's true. I think what you're saying is there's today there's almost a zero tolerance to AI-powered vehicle, yet today there's a lot more acceptance about random type of issues or things that, are, uh, that we've been familiar with for a longer time. And I think we were quite trustful about aviation a little bit less today mm -hmm. when we see some patterns. Do we um, have good example? I think what Seleta was saying is there's a clear need for a public-private partnership in tackling this trust issue and that issue as well. Do any of you have interesting experience of places or experimentation with working private-public partnerships? Yeah, maybe I can uh, mention uh, that all the, I mean, we currently we work in uh, 20 countries uh, and in every country there is a, I would say, a special authorization from national government or local government or a city uh, to uh, operate uh, our vehicle on a certain uh, path uh, under certain circumstances for a certain uh, duration of time. And there is, I must say that there is a, uh, uh, there is really a, a very uh, uh, a big enthusiasm from those uh, s stakeholders to learn about how it's uh, how it's doing, and uh, and I think that it will continue like this. Uh, it will be a step, a, st uh, a progressive uh, implementation. I don't see it as a as a black or white. I think it's going to be very progressive, and the trust from the different stakeholders. Uh, basically uh, the, 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 the regulators and uh, the consumers uh, will come uh, uh, with the time. And it's only the time that will, uh, that will generate uh, the trust in that, uh, in that uh, in autonomous vehicle. And Salim, did you have any interesting example to share on public-private partnerships? Yeah. Uh, actually, if I have to, uh, to pick... Uh, uh, one example, I will pick two actually. <laughs> uh, the first one being, uh, uh, because we, we've seen over the past years uh, a lot of traction in the public sector uh, using cloud technology and it's getting more and more usage of it. Uh, so the first example will be, uh, uh, because we are here in Montreal, uh, the one who, we're in Toronto, you know, uh, we have this, um, this project, uh, Sidewalk Toronto. This is a joint effort by the Waterfront Toronto and Alphabet Sidewalk, lab, sidewalk Labs uh, to create a new kind of mixed-use uh, complete community uh, on Tor Toronto Eastern uh, Waterfront. And uh, this is uh, an interesting partnership between uh, private and public to bring uh, forward-thinking urban design 
and new digital technology to create people-centered neighborhoods, which is really interesting because uh, uh, putting all this technology together, plus the government, plus the citizen itself to design what's going to be the, the future of the city, it's interesting. I'm not the best person to talk about that, but I, I thought it would be interesting to mention this because we are here in Canada. Uh, as a number two, I will talk about um, the Waymo self-driving car that you were mentioning at the beginning with the lighter and so on. Uh, uh, now that we can uh, operating this car in Phoenix, Arizona, and it's really uh, interesting to see a few citizens that, is, uh, that are able to join the program and test this vehicle, actually. And none of this would have been possible if there was not, uh, uh, if the, the government itself and the governor didn't allow self-driving car to, to be run in, the, in, in this state, actually. And uh, I, I like the, the statement that the governor of Arizona uh, did. Uh, it, it said that as technology advances, our uh, policies and priorities uh, must adapt to remain competitive in today's economy. And uh, it also add that uh, this, this order that he made embraced new, uh, new technology by creating an environment that supports autonomous vehicle innovation and maintains the, f uh, the focus on public safety. So this is a really interesting statement because now with those two examples, we can see that if public sector and private sector work together uh, at local level, it brings a lot of use cases for companies to be able to bring that uh, at, a, I would say, a national level and then at the global level. So basically, uh, and maybe to, to, to conclude on this part, uh, for me, having this type of local partnership is really important to make sure that we can show some use cases that can build the trust we were talking about, actually. Uh, and maybe, Dan, do you see other type of companies who are extremely good at building those partnerships to establish trust? Yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, one of the, the four-letter ride-hailing companies has, has made some interesting inroads on that path in, in cities like uh, London and Denver. Uh, they've been uh, pioneering some, some, some of those partnerships. What I would love to see is capitalizing on the trend towards multimodal transportation and if there was some sort of third party, I don't know if it's governmental or, or perhaps uh, uh, one of the larger players out there, uh, a ride-hailing company or a, a Google or, or one of those, um, that could facilitate the connection between uh, different types of transportation. So for example, I get on a train or a, or a bus and, and my, I, I punch in my phone uh, where I'm going and then uh, it's very clear which bus to get on, which train to get on, uh, maybe there's a, a unique identifier associated with my journey. It could be even a color, like a, a blue-green color. And, and then when I get off of that uh, public vehicle, I see next to me either a, a ride-hailing car or a scooter, some sort of micro-mobility offering, and there's a, a little LED bulb on that, uh, which also has that exact same kind of blue-green color. And so it's sort of like a, a trail of breadcrumbs. Uh, it, it's, it's leading me down this path to help me get to my destination. And so some entity needs to coordinate uh, that type of handoff. Uh, at a technology level and, and a business relationship level. Um, so that's something I'm hoping to, to see. Uh, it doesn't really exist yet, but, but I think that would be a, a good opportunity for... Uh, uh, and do you think this uh, new experience, uh, which uh, hev will heavily rely on trust, will come from one existing player, will come from a city, or should come from a disruptor? Maybe that's a question for Celita. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, Los Angeles uh, experimented a little bit with that idea of a, you know, basically an aggregator that is a platform that pulls together different uh, uh, companies that operate in Los Angeles, and you could put in your A to B trip, and it would give you multiple options and stitch together, uh, you know, whether you wanted to get on a bike share and then go to the train and then get a lift at the end or whatever it is. Um, but what we found is that we weren't really the best entity to do that because it required users to download a new app, to input more information, 
Um, and so we, we sort of struggled with that a little bit, which led us to thinking more about how we deliver city services with digital infrastructure and, and APIs um, to all of those different operators that are working in the city so that they're using a common set of language to communicate with me, and I'm using a common set of language to communicate with them to do what I do best, which is really manage the public realm. However, I think there's a real danger if, uh, of, of um, uh, monopolies emerging if an existing player dominates that field and takes advantage of that. And I think that is not usually a good outcome for consumers when you have you know, market dominance with one or, or, or even a duopoly um, because it, it means that um, the, the, there's a real imbalance of power there. They can sort of write the rules themselves um, and, and sort, of, uh, mm, sort of privatize the public realm. So that's a, a danger, but there are tremendous benefits, obviously, from um, having people transition into um, you know, not defaulting to driving by themselves for every single trip. I think that it's also important to underline that for LADOT, we really focus on solving uh, racial and socioeconomic inequity. Transportation is actually really, really hard to make money in um, because transportation is not an end unto itself. What it does is unlock economic mobility for people who live in a city. And um, when you can do that and you can spread it more broadly, um, that's where the economic benefit occurs for everyone. And so how can we in the public sector think about our role, the, the money we have, the, the levers we control to nudge and invest in services that go where they might not otherwise go? Um, and how can we use data in thoughtful ways to hold private companies accountable to serving everybody in the city um, and maybe not necessarily just the neighborhoods that um, are already very wealthy and already have lots and lots of transportation choices, right? Getting to a multimodal future is a, an imperative for the planet, um, but also for a whole bunch of other uh, goals that we have. Um, but it won't work if there isn't a, a good sort of balance between public and private. That's quite interesting. Do you see companies today trying to avoid those algorithm bias, so serving the wealthy and serving uh, where they make most money and making sure we still manage to focus on, a, on a serving the public at large? Well, as, as an investor, the companies that I work with are, are typically trying to uh, you know, they're raising venture capital money. They're, they're showing these forecasts that, that, that show revenue, you know, in year one is kind of like this, and year two is like this, and then year four is like that, you know, and you're right. So, you know, they're, they're, all, uh, they're all trying to, to chart on the, the, uh, the rocket ship uh, velocity trajectory. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, they're all struggling to survive because, because starting a startup is, is super hard. Um, so I don't actually see a lot of, I, I don't feel like a lot of companies uh, feel like they have the luxury to be thinking a whole lot about, um, you know, e equality dynamics and, and the social good, even if they want to. Um, yeah, I'll give you two examples from LA. So we recently have, we have the largest uh, micromobility scooter program in, uh, in the US. We have almost 40,000 scooters and bikes on the streets of Los Angeles right now spread among uh, about eight companies. And we built in incentives for those companies uh, to be able to deploy a larger number and at less cost if they would deploy in specific neighborhoods in the San Fernando Valley. And of the companies that came in to um, be permitted for one year, only one company took advantage of that. That's a delta of almost 5,000 additional vehicles that that company now has as a market advantage compared to their competitors. But it's not clear that we built the right incentives and or that we really understand deeply um, you know, how we can make sure that, that we see our goals emerge. The other example is we have electric vehicle car sharing, uh, and that was very much a public-private partnership. 
And that company uh, specifically deployed in low-income neighborhoods and has about 60% of its members who are low or very low income. But the city is there using public dollars as, as an activist investor to help under, you know, offset the very real risks and costs um, for companies when they're deploying in a new market. They want to minimize that risk. They want to go where they know their product is going to be successful. Our job is to prove that the product can be successful um, in a whole lot of different kinds of neighborhoods in Los Angeles, but we need to probably take a more proactive role in making sure that we get to those outcomes. And maybe, Etienne, we see a lot more companies aligning their business model to the SDGs. Um, part of the SDGs is equality. So do you think the private sector today has a role to play in partnering with you to serve some remote areas or so, some areas that would be more difficult? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's totally in the public and private uh, partnership. The service uh, which we provide is uh, aims, uh, as it is a driverless uh, service, to, uh, to, to, to to be uh, operated at a cheaper cost than uh, the other public uh, uh, transport services. So in the end, uh, it will uh, be uh, useful to uh, cover, uh, to increase the coverage of, uh, of public transportation. And this is a clear benefit that, uh, that uh, we will provide when there will be uh, trust and acceptance for driverless uh, services. Thank you. I would love just to come back just on uh, what you were saying about multimodal transportation, because uh, we, what we're seeing is it's, uh, it's changing really fa fast and uh, it's really transformed the way we, we travel today. Uh, th and actually, uh, we tend to think about what's going to be the future, but the, most of the technology is already here, so obviously it's going to be, be better and better, but we can do a lot of things today with the technology existing. So if you take a, a concrete example, uh, let's say you want to... Uh, to go from here to, uh, we were talking about Toronto, so you go to Toronto from here, so potentially you will take a bus, and then you will go to the railway station, and then you will take a, a, a taxi uh, at, the, at the Toronto station to go to visit a friend or a family, because it's not living downtown. So now the technology can allow you only to have one single ticket, for instance, or potentially not having a ticket at all, because you can use uh, uh, cloud-based recognition uh, to, to really see who you are and potentially send you directly the, the bill into your email and without having to pay uh, for your journey. So this is the kind of thing that is totally doable today. And you can really um, use all this technology to improve the, the customer experience and the uh, inhabitant experience. Interesting. So um, we have a little bit of time to take questions from the public, so I'll shoot for one. Um, in gaining public trust, what guarantees can you provide in regards to cybersecurity? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wait for the second one. So cybersecurity is, a, is, 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 a, is an enormous issue uh, question uh, for the, for the uh, autonomous uh, driving. So currently, uh, since the vehicles are not so much connected uh, uh, cyber sec security is okay uh, because cyber security issues come when there is a, a, a connection, internet connection. Uh, so in the future, with so 5G with, will enable uh, uh, tremendous progress uh, in the in the technology, but it will also bring a tremendous issue to uh, to solve. And uh, imagine that. Uh, um, Imagine that a terrorist can take the control of a, uh, an autonomous uh, vehicle. I think it's, uh, it's really a fear for, uh, for all the governments. And this is something that uh, the industry has to uh, take very uh, seriously. Or, and, or, or an entire fleet. Or an entire fleet, yeah, absolutely. At the same time. So, um, so we, 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 we have to make those, uh, those, um, those vehicles safe, uh, including from a cybersecurity uh, standpoint. It is possible. Of course, uh, because it is possible for other kinds of uh, uh, products today, including the uh, in the aer aeronautics, uh, but it's it's a tremendous uh, challenge. Is it something you see um, companies working on already as a, one of their key priority? Maybe Dan. Uh, yes, there, there are a number of companies working on on cybersecurity uh, and tackling it from all different angles, just just like in. Uh, 
uh, just like in you know other types of security. There there are many many uh, uh, entry points and, and many different ways to, to address them. Uh, and Celita, you explained to us that you were operating on an old technology which prevents you from uh, too many cyber attacks. Do you still see cyber attacks every day or? Yes, yes. There's uh, every single day on the ATSAC system and that's why um, you know, we have audits regularly from Department of Homeland Security um, and other sort of um, entities that are outside the city of Los Angeles who can come in, evaluate and audit our practices and protocols and recommend changes so that we're constantly getting better and keeping up. Um, because, you know, the, if you were able to take control of uh, you know, a traffic management system in any major city around the world, I mean, you could wreak tremendous havoc, and especially a city like Los Angeles, which is massive in scope. Um, you know, that's one of the things that we are grateful for is uh, the way that the, the system was built really without realizing it, it's, it, it's got cybersecurity embedded in its DNA. Thank you. And Selim, do you think uh, the reliance to cloud increases the risk of cyber attacks? Actually, we think the opposite. We think that cloud brings a lot of security. And uh, from the very beginning, uh, we really focus on trust and security in the cloud. Uh, and we also design a company in Alphabet called Chronicle to, do, uh, to, to tackle this cybersecurity issue. So we think that if you think about uh, your money, it's like when you put your money in a bank, uh, is it safer to get it? under your mattress, or is it safer to put it in a bank? So I think it's the same for security. When you put your data in the cloud, you've got dedicated operators to do that. So there is Google Cloud, but there is others to, to be able to really put the best engineer in security to make sure that all your data are safe in the cloud. OK, thank you. Second question, so I'll try to formulate it uh, in the way that is more general. We've talked a lot about partnerships between private and public sector. Um, the operators will benefit a lot from the public data, so typically in your case, Celeta, all the ecosystem data. How do we ensure that the public sector also benefits from the operator's data? So it's a good question and one that we're grappling with um, in Los Angeles. And actually, the uh, mobility data specification is now in use in about 70 or 80 cities around the world. Um, because it's really easy to use and it's creating a lot of information for departments of transportation who uh, we plan facilities, right, to improve bikeways and improve, we need to know where people are riding, but we also enforce and regulate. And the, the granularity and specificity of data that we need to make sure that we can um, carry out our sort of uh, role as the the one who needs to be the, the protector of the public realm, um, it's, it's a pretty high level of granularity. And many cities are uh, growing up in their thinking and how to behave more like a product company and how to bring on board the kind of skill set that you need in order to leverage and take advantage of that. And so I would say we're still, um, you know, cities consume a ton of data right now already. And we use that data to do a lot of, deliver tons of services to people who live in cities. And so now it's just a question of, you know, how do we get to a place where we are just breathing in and breathing out data and delivering um, city services via that data and via those APIs? Um, I think that's going to be the moment when you see the, the, the private sector really understand the value of the public sector having that tool in the toolbox. Um, but it requires a new, new skill sets inside city government. It requires um, us to handle in a very sober way uh, cybersecurity, privacy, trust, and transparency. Um, and it requires then, you know, people who sit in my chair in cities around the world um, to understand, you know, w what an API even is, right? That DOTs have not been in that business up until now. And I think that's going to be one of the main limiters to everybody's success. Mm. Dan, Etienne? Well, I think that... Uh in the, in the future and with autonomous vehicles, cities will more and more have a role to produce uh, public data uh, and especially to produce, uh, for example, detailed uh, mapping of their, of their streets uh, for, the, for the private uh, operators. And the question is, uh, 
maybe the private operators could, could do that, uh, but in the end, the question is uh, who uh, is responsible for organizing public space and uh, who is responsible for giving the uh, most accurate data about uh, how the public space is, uh, is uh, configured. And that's, uh, that, that's a real question. Uh, either each uh, private uh, uh, player is uh, gathering the data and managing its own data, or the data is, uh, is uh, managed by the public space. Uh, that's uh, an interesting question for the future. And if, if autonomous vehicles are relying on data about the configuration of the public realm for their operation, and something goes wrong, you know, cities are accustomed to holding that liability. And I think we have to figure out how can we share data in order to share risk? Um, because I think that's going to be a really important question for how these things roll out in, in cities in a way that, um, that benefits everybody who lives there. Yeah. That was a perfect conclusion. Thank you very much to all. I hope you enjoyed the discussions.